What's up, everybody? Welcome to Marvel Standom. And once again this week, we are exploring the multiverse with What If Episode 2, which is all about what if T'Challa became Star-Lord. With me for all time and always, I have Den of Geek News and Features Editor Kirsten Howard and Den of Geek TV Editors Katie Burt and Alec Bajalik. Kirsten, why don't you tell everybody what happened in this episode? In Episode 2, we get to find out how much better T'Challa is at being Star-Lord than Peter Quill as the would-be Black Panther travels the galaxy with Yondu and the Ravagers. We quickly realise how many lives T'Challa has touched throughout his time as Star-Lord, and we also see how many he's saved, even managing to talk Thanos round from his genocidal plans. Unfortunately, the MCU love-in has a twist in its final moments, as the Watcher lets us catch up with an older Peter mopping the floor at Dairy Queen, an ego swooping in to manipulate him. Sometimes I uh, joke around with Kirsty that that doesn't quite cover all of the coolness in the episode, but in this case, it kind of does. Uh, this was basically like a joyful 30 plus minutes of Marvel TV with just like completely pure and unabashed love for not just Chadwick Boseman and T'Challa, but you know, the, the cosmic corner of the MCU in general. You know, what folks might want to do, just on the off chance that you're tuning into Marvel Standom without having watched this episode yet, if you haven't watched Black Panther and you haven't watched both Guardians of the Galaxy movies and maybe Avengers Infinity War, this might not be the episode for you. But if that's the case, I don't know what you're doing here in the first place, folks. So, you know, let's, uh, let's keep it moving. Uh, but... What did everybody think of this? Because I just had an absolute blast with it, even setting aside the kind of bittersweet nature of hearing Chadwick Boseman's voice one more time. I loved this episode so much, which I wasn't necessarily expecting going in because especially the first Guardians of the Galaxy is not my favorite. You know, when you were mentioning that Kirstie sometimes isn't able to pack everything about an episode or movie all into one very brief synopsis. Um, I think that says a lot about how, like, thematically um, focused this episode was. You know, it starts with this question that the Watcher has whether, you know, who we are is the nature of the world we're in or the nature of the person. And it says a lot about how good this episode was that it went with the it is the nature of the person argument. This episode got me because T'Challa and Chadwick Boseman are so damn charming. And this episode was was both fun and emotionally moving, even without the, you know, Chadwick Boseman of it all. I also loved it. What if is really works because it's so uh, character focused. I mean, Katie, like you said, it's uh, the Watcher's argument is essentially that uh, individuals change the world rather than world-changing individuals. And I feel like that's kind of the case for this show itself when it comes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because this is essentially two weeks in a row now, the exact same story that we've seen before, or at least the exact same framework of a story we've seen before, just with different characters mad-libbed in. And that's been really fun to see about how character drives things rather than plot or situations. I think another fun, another way you know that this is a fun episode is look at the cast list. It was like remarkable and, and shocking enough that uh, they got Chadwick Boseman to return to, to be the lead in this. But they got Josh Brolin for a minor role, Kurt Russell back for a cameo, even Denai Guerrera turns up as a Koye. Benicio del Toro, like it's literally <laughs> Carrie Coons in there as Proxima Midnight, who has like all of like four minutes of screen time in the entire MCU. Uh, I just think that's indicative of the fact that A, Marvel has either decided to start paying a lot better, or B, everybody knows that this was a really fun idea and wanted to be involved. Maybe a combination of the two. Yeah, or a little bit of column A, column B. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there were so many great character moments in this episode. Um, I've got to say my favorite was perhaps Nebula. They took her from sort of a broken, deadly assassin to a kind of old-timey dame. She was like a blue <laughs> Jessica Rabbit. She sauntered in with her and, ah, hey, cha-cha. I just really loved that <laughs> whole thing. I found it delightful. I couldn't believe just how hard they leaned into this like the idea that this would be so different um you know like it's not just a matter of okay you take you know you take t'challa out of wakanda and then you know his life is going to follow a certain kind of path with the ravagers 
But instead, he is like a better Star Lord than Peter Quill ever was. You know, he's almost like a sports superstar or like a like a celebrity or or an influencer or something. You know, and I guess like if you wanted to nitpick this, like the one thing that you could kind of say is like, you know. Would Yondu's whole outlook really have been that different? You know what I mean? Is like, is is a convincing argument really enough to turn Thanos away from the path of genocide? Sure, like we could probably make a fuss about that, but like, why why would you when when something is just so inherently about you know the potential goodness in everybody? Having watched it twice now, it just it just puts you in a good mood. It works on that level of a, kind of literally a charming what if, which is what we're supposed to be doing here. But I think maybe on one slightly deeper level is that we, the only T'Challa we ever got to see was a monarch. And that's, I would imagine, pretty hard and like pretty heavy. And here, removed from those responsibilities, he's just kind of a big goofball. Just a big, lovable goofball that everybody loves. And he just saves the galaxy through sheer charm and force of will. <laughs> In the comics, often the what-if vibe is that it's a good thing that, you know, the official continuity, the sacred timeline is what it is, because otherwise things would have turned out way, way worse. Like, I have not read as many what-if stories uh, as I imagine Kirsten has, as some of our uh, Denegi colleagues have, but the ones that I have read, I would have to imagine that the the vast balance of what-if comic book stories it ends up like everything turned out way worse for everybody. With this episode, things undeniably <laughs> turn out better for the universe. At least, at least you know, you know, assuming what we know or don't know about the final shot in the episode, of course. But like, things are way better for uh, for T'Challa ending up with the Ravagers than they were if Peter had. Uh, you know, certainly for half the life in the universe. I feel like it tells us that. Peter Quill, as shit as he is, needed to be Star-Lord because otherwise Ego would have carried on with his plans and completely won and done as much damage, maybe more, as Thanos. Yeah, I uh, I totally agree. It goes back to that argument of, like, if you would go back in time, would you kill baby Hitler? And everybody just says, like, obviously, I'll kill that infant. Sure, why not? But you don't know if that's going to lead to a timeline with, like, a Mecha Hitler or something. Um, Are you comparing Peter Quill with Hitler? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't know what the, 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 the effect of the causes we take. Like, um, and I do think that's what the episode's communicating at the end there. We're like, things were way better with T'Challa as Star-Lord. Like... Wars were averted. Genocides were stopped. Thanos is a nice guy. But if Peter hadn't have been around in that role, it would have led to the ultimate death of everybody in the universe via ego. This isn't really like an Easter eggy kind of episode. And I feel like that's kind of going to be the case throughout these shows. Like there's going to be tons of callbacks to the movies. Um, you know, everybody knows what those are. But nevertheless, there's still a lot of surprises and there's a lot of fun ways that they that they do this. Just the fact that Drax is happy and has a family, I think, is is something that kind of feels like a little bit special. What were everybody else's favorite surprises throughout the episode? I mean, I love the Drax moment. I love Drax. I love his affect. I love that even though he's lived a drastically different life in some ways, he's still very similar. Like in my notes I wrote, never change Drax because he just has the exact same energy. And I don't want to steal this from anyone else, but as someone who recently watched Tower of the Death for the first time, it was very cool to see Howard the Duck in this episode. And I knew it was coming because he was in the trailer, but I still had like a... Uh, audible reaction moment um, and also to see Howard the Duck a little bit classier than he's depicted in the live action, action movie we just watched um, yeah this just seemed to very much be like more of a like gimmick is the wrong word but like very much just like an easter egg fun cameo I don't know if there's like a there would be a point for him coming back but I'd also be open to that um, yeah, it's still, it's still Nebula, but perhaps her relationship with Thanos here is more interesting to me. Like, she seems to have escaped much of the abuse that he put her through. Um, 
to the point where you know she sees him across the bar and she's like ugh dad you know embarrassing but <laughs> rather than dad you know of course anything you say you know yeah i think it's it's still nebula i have to just echo katie's sentiments about howard here but i am you know a, a howard stan since childhood and this is very much the closest I feel we've gotten to Howard's personality in the original Steve Gerber comics. Like, yeah, he's a little bit even classier than I feel that he was depicted in those comics, but the underlying uh, anxiety and depression of the character that has never really been properly translated to other mediums is kind of there. I am 100% now on the campaign trail to make Howard the Duck the MCU's like next animated series. The only way Howard can be done properly is in animation. And I hope there's enough of a response from fans that this kind of pushes them to make something like that happen. Please look forward to our spinoff show, Howard Standom. Howard Standom is coming yeah. if I have anything to say about it. Yes. Uh... <laughs> do, it do it for Mike. <laughs> Question for the entire crowd. Did they use all of the embers of Genesis in their escape, or do they have some left? Because it seems like they had a plan for those, hmm. <laughs> and then they just kind of used them to escape. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't really matter, but I'm like, yeah. those seem pretty powerful. Not that I am not for saving your found family, yeah. but... I have to imagine they used them all, because we do get that shot of nowhere, <clears throat> you know, like the skull was growing... Mm -hmm moss like a like a chia pet like a giant cosmic celestial <laughs> chia pet so i think that's probably sorry starving that. planet yeah like they probably just had enough for one planet sized thing that's my guess it is kind of cool that we get to see wakandans in space in this episode too and what one thing that i have to wonder about there's like the dora milaji pilots on that ship right but they seem to be are they in stasis? Like, are they supposed to come out of stasis only when T'Challa is located? I didn't quite understand what was going on there. I thought they were like creepy mannequins. And then like yes. the Wakandans were elsewhere, like trapped maybe or dead. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. How yeah, it was were... very unsettling. Though. I thought they were like a museum exhibit. Nevertheless, this is not the first uh, kind of hint at spacefaring Wakandans that we've had in the MCU or even on Marvel TV. Uh, in the very first episode of Loki, when we had the Miss Minutes orientation video, which we all love so much, there's a moment where you see the Kree kind of going to war with an army dressed in, you know, purple and blue and black. And their whole, you know, silhouette kind of felt panthery and i read that as a nod to the idea that that wakandans are destined to be a spacefaring people at some point and uh even that is taken from recent comics where look we know that the wakandans have the technological know-how to build spacefaring craft but the recent run of black panther by ta-nehisi kotez that just wrapped uh which is fantastic like just an absolutely essential all-time run on the character. A good chunk of that is devoted to an intergalactic Wakandan empire. So next week is a very different episode of What If, and if you want to do a little bit of homework before you watch that one, you have a week to watch pretty much all of Marvel Phase 1. Like, get yourself up through the first Avengers movie and you should be pretty good. And as for us, we'll be back here right after that episode recapping this and all future episodes of what if and everything else going on in the mcu multiverse thank you all very much for watching make sure that you hit that subscribe button follow us on twitter at marvel standom you can also find us on twitter at den of geek us and at den of geek we are everywhere all over the internet and don't forget our official web home of den of geek.com thanks for watching everybody we'll see you next week You know what they say, when you're out of luck, always go duck. I'm pretty sure no one says that. Oh, they say it. Really? Totally. 